Mish Khan Academy Digital Sessions. Hello everyone, I'm Simon Leaf and I head up the sports group here at Mishcon and I'm a partner at the firm. A big, warm, sporting welcome to the next edition of our Sports Law Academy series for 2021-2022. After the last 18 months or so, it's great to see so many people here at our home in Africa House, but also welcome to the hundreds of people that have joined the session remotely by Zoom. As many of you all know, we ran the entirety of last season's SLA virtually where we had over 1,700 participants from over 40 countries, ultimately culminating in us needing to upgrade the firm's Zoom account. We were blown away by the level of passion, interest, and engagement from the attendees. And I'm sure this year will be no different, especially as we move to being able to run the sessions both online and in person. And the fact that we've been able to secure some incredible speakers for you over the course of the next few months. I'm really excited to get this year's Sports Law Academy underway and hope you thoroughly enjoy what we have in store. For now, I'm delighted to hand you over to Tom Murray and look forward to meeting many of you that are here today in our bar downstairs at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. From the four corners of the boxing industry to the four corners of Mishkondorea, we're delighted to welcome three absolute heavyweights of the boxing industry. First up, he joins us all the way from New York in the United States of America, fresh out of the Lopez Cambozos card on Saturday night at Madison Square Garden. He's the reigning, the defending, the unbeating Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel of Eddie Hearn's Matching Boxing. Joining us via Zoom, it's Sean Palmer. Next up, set to make his Sports Law Academy debut, fighting out of the middle seat, we have the hard-hitting contender, the head of boxing at Anthony Joshua's 258 Management, it's Will the Hitman Harvey. Set to make his ring walk from Hackney, London, England, the reigning, the defending, the undefeated WBO cruiserweight champion of the world. His professional record is a perfect one. 17 victories, 14 by which coming by way of knockout. It's Dr. Lawrence, the source of Coley. And finally, wearing the blue suit with the green trim, weighing in slightly more than I did at the start of, of the pandemic, you have me, Tom Murray. Now, before we get started, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice we have an all-male panel this evening. Um, unfortunately, two of our female guests did have to drop out, um, and we are very much committed to ensuring we have a diversity of speakers. And overall, for the Sports Law Academy, we have over 50% women, so keep a lookout for that going forward. So, Sean, perhaps we can start with you. It'd be great if you could give a quick overview of your role at Matchroom, and perhaps for the casual fans in attendance, give a brief summary of the role of a promoter in boxing. Thank you. Thank you again, Tom, for having me. Um, so, my role at Matchroom is Chief Operating Officer uh, and General Counsel. Uh, the sort of short summary is I do all the boring stuff for Eddie, pretty much. So if it's uh, law related, tax related, finance related, I tend to get involved in it. In terms of Matchroom, uh, sort of a very brief introduction as a whole, as you mentioned, we're probably by most metrics, the biggest promoter of boxing globally. Um, our role is to kind of put on the event. And Sean, what area of boxing would you most like to reform and why? I do feel the lack of any kind of central regulation in boxing is the key thing that one, surprises people. But two, I think also could change and if done properly for the better, could mean both the fighters, the fans and ultimately the sport as a whole all get a better deal. Um, so I feel like, again, talking to the sort of broader audience who haven't been involved in boxing, there is no central boxing body globally, like, say, FIFA or the NBA. Everything is done on a country by country basis. We have world championship organisations, indeed four major ones, but all of those perform less of a kind of regulatory role and more of literally handing out belts or allowing fighters to compete for belts. And I think the effect of that overall means that it creates a lot of issues and problems. You look at kind of anti-doping or fighter safety. There is no kind of central body that helps regulate it. And then I guess the other big uh, sort of lacking that you get from a lack of um, a central regulatory body is you look at titles. And I think one of the, the hardest things to explain to casual fans of boxing is there are four world championships in every single division. Um, and the rankings are sometimes very unfair within those divisions. And obviously on the stage, like Lawrence has worked incredibly hard and to achieve the dream of being world champion. And now he's in a position where he's struggling to try and get the other uh, world champions to fight him because ultimately he would love to be undisputed. And I feel like the lack of any clear way that we can force people to take those fights is obviously very frustrating for someone like Lawrence, but also for the fans. If there was one area of boxing that you would like to reform, what would it be and why? All of a sudden you could go from making no money in a fight to making hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds 
and then not knowing what to do with it. So you see so many boxers who've come before, have made like a lot of money and then have, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, have spent it all or lost it all, however. So I feel like there needs to be a lot more like financial education, um, just on like even simple stuff like taxing and like, um, you know, making money and then reinvesting it to make more money and just all that kind of stuff. So I feel like um, it should actually be taught earlier. I know, I think it should be taught in schools, but it's about boxing anyway. So I think with as soon as you become a boxer, at whatever level you should be taught that kind of stuff. So if you do go on and make that money, you know what to do with it. Do you think that's a responsibility of, the, of say, the sanctioning bodies or do you think it's something that the British Boxing Board of Control should do? Uh, probably like the, the individual boards as um, our man here said there's no um, central, you know, thing with boxing. And I think it'd be hard to implement because it's such a big sport globally and there's so many different belts and it'd be hard to come in and sort of create a powerhouse, but hopefully it, it can get done. Um, but the, the thing that I would say is that it should be the British Board of Control, one aspect, but then also the governing bodies, because when you do make it to that level, they're, you know, the ones who are obviously giving out the belts and whatever else. So there should be, yeah, like I said, a mix of it. In football, I can't remember the stats, Ben or Ted, Ted, Ted but I think it's about 30% of Premier League footballers go bankrupt within two years of... Two thirds of wow. footballers go bankrupt within within two thirds within two years of retiring. Five years after they finish playing. Yeah. Well, okay, five years. So yeah, it's a, it's one of those one of those issues where it feels like there should be something that's done by whether it's by the governing bodies or by the sanctioning bodies or other people within the industry to provide greater support. And it's but it's not something that just obviously affects boxing. It's it's across uh, across the sports industry. So Will, over to you. So you uh, you manage Lawrence's career. So you're. Uh, you're obviously, you're obviously in charge of a lot of these big decisions. Mm -hmm. So before we delve into your reform topic, could yeah. you give a, just a quick overview about what you do at 258 and sort of who, you, who else you manage? Well, we call ourselves a, a 360 degree management company. So the business model that we have traditionally in boxing um, with a lot of our competitive competitors, other management agencies is that they have quite a few, and I think it's more similar in football as well. They have quite a few athletes on their book. They, you know, MTK, for example, big competitor of ours have hundreds and hundreds of fighters that they that they manage we are a lot more involved in every aspect of our fighters career so so we kind of take the quality over quantity approach it's anthony's company and he was our first essentially client that we that we managed and represented and then uh we built it out uh at the end of 2016 start of 2017 when that when that olympic cycle what are you laughing at oh, sorry, <laughs> he, he doesn't he never heard me speak like this before that's probably right <laughs> yeah had had a lot of good relationships with a lot of uh, the olympians that came out of that system um, and looked to be involved in every aspect of their career. So what it meant really was that we wouldn't be working with anyone and everybody. We wanted to work with people that we thought could A, uh, operate at world level, be world champions in the ring, but also outside of the ring. Had a bit of a blueprint that we'd started to establish with Anthony, which was the kind of commercial potential and value that they had outside as well so that they can transcend the sport. The area which I think boxing could be reformed is I would like to see, really, the creation of something like a professional boxers association. Mm. Um, I would like to see created because the, the problem that I think uh, exists with boxing, one, okay, the, the financial education is, is very important. The problem is I don't think there are a lot of um, fighters that have the people around them that actually can educate them on these issues and make them aware of how they need to be managing their money. It also goes into things like, you know, your post-career and post-career planning, again, mm. Once you retire, the second that you retired, your training team and everything falls away, your managers leave you, and then you've actually got to, you know, you might have been maintaining a certain quality of life whilst you were fighting and earning money. You're now faced with the rest of your life, you know, that adrenaline rush and that, and that, that sensation of, of being, like, at the top of your game. When it goes, it can often leave a bit of a, a void and a vacuum in a person's life, and I think, actually, that can create vulnerability in these fighters where they can be sus uh, suspect to, to, to various mental health problems. The establishment of, of a professional boxers association that can look after the interests of, of these fighters and provide them with the support that they need yeah. um, is very important. And what, what, what do you think that would look like in practice? So do you think it would be, you know, to become a licensed boxer with the British Boxing Board of Control, you then automatically are given membership to a professional boxers association that could then yeah. I don't know, provide insurance so that if you were to lose or you were to suffer yeah. a brain injury, that it, the insurance would pay out then. It provides education, it provides collective bargaining. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't necessarily know that it needs to be, like, 
sort of something you gain access to when you get a professional uh, boxer's license because I think it needs to be something that's truly independent, so independent of something like the British Boxing Board mm. of Control, independent of any management agency, because issues that fighters experience often can be from the mistreatment by promoters or the mistreatment by managers or, or whoever else. And Lawrence, is that something that you you would uh, you'd like? Would you, would you be willing to pay, pay into a, a professional? Wow. Oh, no, hundred well, percent. I think obviously the paying for it part is a bit um, of a difficult one because, um, so, like, boxing is actually like a sport where it looks really glamorous, but a lot of times boxers aren't get even boxers who you spot on TV might not be getting paid that much as well. So it's kind of like it's a difficult thing to kind of ask someone now who mm. can't see the value in it at that time because. It, yeah. When you're a boxer, you feel invincible when you're going into the ring. And not not deluded, but you have that sense of, like, just uh, you can't be beaten. So to, you know, be putting money into it is a bit, it's a bit difficult. But I feel like maybe, like, another way is, like, a, it would be, like, a sort of taxing, if, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. a little portion might slip out yeah. just, to, just, to keep, just to keep it going around. But then I would almost maybe see it as as a, as a, almost like a, a charitable initiative. Like it's a not-for-profit organisation. It's a charity that, that maybe relies on donations. So mm. whether that is former fighters, like like okay, Anthony, for example, has got generational wealth now, and I'm sure an offer something like that presented to him, he would be happy to donate a significant amount of money to. And Sean, we've we've sort of touched on the fact, you know, that not many top boxers receive professional advice, whether it be from a legal perspective, whether it be from a financial perspective. In your experience, you know, what percentage of boxers that, that you deal with um, have sort of proper legal backing, have proper financial backing, have and have, you know, the support of a, of a, of a top management agency? The, the short answer is not enough. It's one of the, the most upsetting parts of, of my job sometimes, because obviously our interests are in most cases aligned with the boxer, but we're always very clear about the fact that we represent the promotional company and the broadcaster and not having effective management is sometimes so frustrating. Like some of the worst occasions I've had is when I've sent a first draft of a contract and then it's come back signed. And I've always said to, like, I've always phoned them and said, look, this is against our interest here, but you should have someone look at this. You should have a lawyer look at this. You should have a management company look at this. And again, like I like to think that we're a very positive example of a company that wouldn't take advantage of a boxer, however poorly advised they are. But some of the contracts I've seen fighters sign prior to joining us with promotional companies. And they're so onerous and unscrupulous. And because, like going back to my point, there's no regulation of these contracts, really. In the UK, you can have situations where, where a fighter can have a promoter who is also their manager, yeah. which is a massive conflict of interest. Because so my so Sean, like I said, Match have an impeccable record with looking after their fighters. This obviously doesn't apply, <laughs> apply to someone like Sean, but Sean as the promoter. Though they're, they're an events-based business, mm -hmm. you know, and, and essentially they are trying to, as an events-based business, for them in the broadcaster, they need to make as much money on the show as possible. Now, you look at the simple P&L, they do that by obviously generating as much money through sponsorship and ticket sales, but also reducing the cost as much as possible. So our job as the manager is to maximise our clients' earnings. So we need to go to Sean and his team and essentially take as much money off them as possible. If you are the manager and the promoter, there's a huge con conflict of interest there. One thing we've touched on is this, this fragmented governance structure that exists in boxing. So you've got these four governing bodies. You've got the, the World Boxing Association, which was founded in 1921. You've got the World Boxing Council, which was founded in 1963. The International Boxing Federation, founded in 1976. And the World Boxing Organization, was founded in 1988. And these four sort of bodies compete for power with one another. They all have their own ranking system, they all have their own um, titles, and most of the bodies were formed following sort of allegations of corruption um, or that people were favouring certain boxers. The more governing bodies there are and the more champions there are, the harder it is to, to, to essentially get what the fans want, which is one undisputed unified division, one champion at the top of their, of their weight class, which is what everybody wants to see. Let's look at Matchroom's model, as you've done in, in snooker um, and in dart. Do you think that there's an argument in favour of, of following the, sort of the Matchroom, the matchroom um, model in snooker and darts in boxing? And was that something you'd like to see? Uh, obviously, yes. <laughs> but I think it needs to be done properly. And again, talking against our interests in a way that protects the fighters and the fans from having that kind of monopoly. So I do think there is a space for a body or a model where 
the best fight the best every week. Fans don't have to wait ages and ages for fights. We have like Mayweather and Pacquiao not taking years to make and probably pass mm-hmm. his prime because that those kind of things all lead to way at the sport to the point where um, people get frustrated. So just on, on this topic on, on, on the number of belts, so there's, there's 17 weight divisions in boxing, there's four governing bodies, quick maths, 68 world titles there in the men's division alone. But they, you know, the, the sanctioning bodies don't really stop there. So the, the WBA and WBC have faced massive criticism for the number of box, number of belts that they have. Just, Lawrence, on, for you on this, you, you're the currently the WBO World Cruiser title, and you've previously held the WBO's International Cruiser title and the WBA's Continental Cruiser title, as well as multiple other belts. So do you think that the number of belts available in boxing is provides up-and-coming talent with an opportunity to be celebrated? and make a name for themselves, or do you think we get to the point where there's just too many belts that exist now? Those belts kind of help um, make fights bigger than they are, because a lot of times pe- like fans just want to see two people fighting for something, so it gives something to fight for, and also it prepares you mentally for the, um, the feeling of actually going into a fight with nothing and leaving with something. There's two sides to it, so obviously something like the UFC, because it's only one body and one belt, it, may, it means that the fans get all of these, you know, great fights, but then I see some of the purses that the, um, that the UFC fighters are getting, and a lot of them are, you know, three, four, ten times more famous and um, probably get a lot more on the gate and a lot more eyes on it, but they're getting paid less than, mm-hmm. like, a, a normal boxer. Mm-hmm. So it kind, of, it kind of means that all the power is in the hands of the promoter and the networks and stuff, because if you want to box for a belt, you have to box this guy and this, for this much. And, and that could be the same if there's only one world title belt. You know, they would have the power to say, well, no, he's boxing it. And, you, and they could be a really good fighter who never gets the opportunity because they um, are not liked by the governing body and then they go their whole career without ever winning a world title. So it's a, it's, it's a difficult one to kind of um, say there's plus and minus to both, to be fair. As we draw an end to these proceedings, I want to say thank you to our our members of our esteemed panel. Thanks very much for joining everyone. Cheers. Thanks so much. Mishkan Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishkan.com.